Good morning, Catalyst. How are you guys doing this morning? How many of y'all are glad to be at church this morning? I am very, very glad to be here. Very, very glad. Um, like Tim said, that uh, we, we have a worship night coming up next Wednesday, not this coming Wednesday, next Wednesday. If you've never been to a Catalyst worship night, it is, uh, it's a fantastic time. Uh, I want to invite everybody to come on back here at 7 o'clock uh, on that Wednesday, the 31st, and we have two services for Easter. As you can tell, this is a non-Easter Sunday, and we're expecting a big crowd for Easter because last year uh, we were all isolated in our homes last year for Easter, so we're expecting lots of people. So 9.30 and 11 o'clock, and invite people, invite people. Um, we really want as many people as possible to hear the message of Jesus. That is what we're here for as a church. Uh, so we are finishing up our MOVE series. If you've been with us uh, over the past several weeks, you know about the Four Chair Discipleship thing. If this is your first time, not a problem at all. All of our sermons are online. If you want to go to our YouTube page and uh, go look up Catalyst Christian Church, Nicholasville, Kentucky, and you can watch every single one of them. Um, we, we, we try to make that available as, as, available as possible. So I want to thank all you guys for doing that. Um, I found an amazing quote from a famous Greek philosopher. His name is Mediocrates. And he said, eh, good enough. That was his quote. That was, that was a quote from the Stoic philosopher Mediocrities. And uh, as, as I recently reconnected with my fourth grade math teacher, Miss Larson. She was fantastic. She was a great math teacher. And she found me online, asked me how I was doing. And I remembered, I said, I said two things. I said, I still know my multiplication tables. And I still have a bad case of carelessness-itis. That's what she called carelessness-itis. It was the thing that caused most of her students to make, make problems, it, it, uh, to make mistakes. It wasn't that we didn't know the material. It was leaving a decimal point off here or not th checking our work. It was called carelessness-itis. And I, I, I had a bad case of it then. I still have a bad case of it now. Uh, but most of us do to some extent, especially when it comes to math. Okay, how many, how many math geeks we have out there? Are, are, are you a math geek, like really good at math? Uh, okay, <laughs> not many. Okay, awesome. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so, uh, but the scourge of carelessness-itis is nothing compared to its mutated cousin. And that is the cousin virus, That's Good Enough-itis. Uh, That's Good Enough-itis is a pandemic that makes COVID-19 look tame. Uh, symptoms of That's Good Enough-itis are this. Not realizing your God-given potential. Leading a life of quiet desperation, as what Ralph Waldo Emerson so eloquently stated. Never realizing your dreams. Achieving half or less of what you could achieve in this very short time we have called life. Those are symptoms of, good, of that's good enough-itis. More serious symptoms of good, that's good enough-itis as they invade the church. Is this, lost people never hearing the gospel. Orphans dying of easily curable diseases simply because people don't care. Churches not being planted. Ministries not being started. Christians looking at the world and quoting mediocrities. Eh, good enough. Why is that's good enough, Itis, such an issue? Why is it so prevalent in our lives? Why can we never seem to conquer it? Well, it's easy because that's good enough, Itis, is the default. That's good enough, itis is like gravity, is always pulling us towards it. And without active uh, going against, unless you jump and break the earth's gravitational pull on you, you're going to stay here. And, and, and as soon as you jump, it's going to pull you back down. That's what that's good enough, itis does to us. It's true in life, but especially true when it comes to our faith, and it's nothing new. See, the problem is, is that that's good enough itis, and the Bible has a darker word. The Bible calls it lukewarmness. Lukewarmness. And there's a very famous passage in Revelation that a lot of people have heard, talking about the church at Laodicea. Uh, some, some believe it's symbolic of the church in the end times, right before Jesus returns. The Revelation 3, 15 through 17, this is what Jesus says to that church. I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and don't need a thing. But you don't realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I've realized that I will battle that's good enough-itis, biblically known as lukewarmness, my whole life. 
My default nature is inaction. My, fault, my default nature is to say, eh, good enough. And people in Laodicea weren't any worse than you or I. They get such a bad rap, but they are us. They are us. One of the greatest men in the Bible is King David, the guy who was named after me. And he's the guy who killed Goliath. He's the one who issued in the golden age of Israel. You can study his life in 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings. Uh, and he's, he's the guy who the Bible refers to as a man after God's own heart. In other words, he's a giant of the faith. Okay, he's somebody that was to look up to. He's somebody that we had that had it all together that we can really look to for an example. Until we look at how he finished in his early years, he was so devoted to God, wholeheartedly. He had his spiritual victories then. However, that's good enough. I just set in in his life. And I don't know when it happened. I don't even think he knew when it happened. But in his later years, he let his devotion to God fall by the wayside. At some point, all of his spiritual victories were in his past, not in his future. And he finished poorly. The two biggest events of his later years was adultery with Bathsheba and the taking of his senses, which caused the deaths of 76,000 Israelites. It's a tragedy, but all too common. How many of us in here plan on finishing this life strong? How many? How many really plan on finishing this life strong? Okay? How many of us, when we look at life, can honestly say, my biggest spiritual victories are still in my future. They're not in the past. They're in the future. They're coming up, and I haven't seen them yet. My biggest spiritual victories are still in my future. How many of us can honestly say that? I'd like to say all of us. But the Bible is any predictor, you all. That's not going to be true for most of us. It's not. Very few people in the Bible finish strong. Most follow the pattern of faithfulness to God, blessing to God, lukewarmness, and then falling away. If you look at the Bible, that's what most people do. That's simply because lukewarmness, like gravity, is the default. It's a siren call to us. It calls to our hearts to just say, that's good enough. I, I've done enough. I'm, 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 I'm done. I, I just want to sit here and just exist. That is the siren call to our souls. And that is how so many Christians will finish this life with all their spiritual victories in the past. You understand? Well, maybe not. Well, let's look at the laws of physics and see what's going on. See, there are two, like the laws of physics, there are two spiritual laws at work with us. And they're the same as laws of physics. The first one is inertia. The second one is friction. Inertia states this, an object or person will remain in its current state of motion unless acted upon by an outside force. That's what the law of inertia says. Okay? If, unless, unless some physical force acts on you, it, you're going to stay where you are. This keyboard here is going to stay here. I mean, we can sit here and watch it. All right? Let's sit here and watch it. Let's see if it moves. Law of inertia. Right there. You know, the only, you know when it's going to move? It's when it's acted on by an outside force. Then it moves. That's what inertia says. And guys, the same is true of you in your walk with Christ. If you are sitting there doing nothing, you are going to stay there and do nothing. If you are actively engaged in the purpose of Christ, you are going to stay actively engaged in the purpose of Christ. The law of inertia. The second is the law of friction. And this is a, the friction is this, the force that resists relative motion between two objects in contact. Friction is always trying to stop motion. If I was to roll a ball, eventually it would stop. Why? Because of friction. It would eventually stop. All right? And guys, friction is working on you right now. It is working on your heart. It is trying to stop you from making any uh, spiritual gains, any conquering of sin. Friction is working against you right now, trying to slow you down and get you to stay lukewarm. Those are the physical, spiritual forces working on you right now. And they are as universal as the laws of physics. My wife and I were talking about this week. We were, we were so lazy on Tuesday. All right? I don't know if anybody was lazy on Tuesday. It's like maybe it was like this spiritual thing going on. But on Tuesday, my wife and I did nothing. We got home from work, and we sat down, and we did not get up from the couch till it was bedtime. We were so lazy. There was all kinds of stuff to do. But we didn't. 
We were talking about it on a Wednesday, just how lazy we were, and one of us made a statement, probably her. Um, she said, do you feel like laziness breeds more laziness? While action breeds more action? I'm like, yeah, that is very true. I mean, the more I sit on the couch, the tireder I got. The less I wanted to do something. And see, guys, that's the spiritual law of inertia at work right there. People who produce fruit for the kingdom who make disciples are going to remain in that state, although friction is working against them. People say no to Jesus, remain in that state as well, unless the Holy Spirit acts on you. Practice doesn't make perfect, you guys. Practice makes permanent. We are what we repeatedly do. And if you always say no to Jesus, you are practicing it makes permanent. If you're always saying yes to Jesus, then that's going to make it permanent as well. Right? But the thing that bothers me the most, seriously, this is the thing that keeps me up at night as a pastor. Because I love you all so much. You all are, are my family. You all, are, you all I, I'm closer with the people in this room than I am a lot of people in my own family. Really. And I love you and I care about you so much. And the thing that bothers me, that grieves me most as a pastor, isn't that's good enough itis slash lukewarmness. That's not the thing that bothers me. You want to know the thing that bothers me, keeps me up at night? brings tears to my prayers, is this, is that lukewarmness is the goal. It's the vision. It's what so many people in this room, as much as I love you, it's what so many people in this room and joining us online, that is what you're going for. That is, that's how you know you've arrived when you, have, when you are lukewarm. Lukewarmness doesn't bother you. It's actually your goal as a Christian. It's kind of, okay, imagine this big, huge, awesome, creative, amazing, perfect God, okay? He is, he's, he's all over all creation. He's the sovereign. He is everything, all right? And in his majesty and his awesomeness and his brilliance, and here we are in this little ball of dirt and water in this tiny little universe. Yeah, I said tiny little universe compared to God. The universe is tiny. And here we are in this insignificant little pocket of this tiny little insignificant universe on this ball of dirt. And the universe apparently is 13.8 billion years old. That's what scientists, a lot smarter than me, said, said that it is. And so if you live for the, ex for the life expectancy on this planet to 78 years old, that means you're going to live for 0.000005% of its existence. It really is true that when the Bible says we're a mist that appears for a while and we're gone. Okay, so here's you, you, tiny little insignificant loved you on this tiny little insignificant ball of dust in this tiny universe compared to this awesome God. And the God of the universe looks at you and says, you can know me, you can be in fellowship with me, you can know my mind, you can know, you can follow me, you, I can give you the purpose. And we look at him and go, yeah, uh, maybe. I don't know. I, 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 God, I mean, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. I'm, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't know. And God looks at us and he's like, are you serious? Are, are you serious? You are actually looking at me and saying, I, I, yeah, maybe. I, I mean, I just, I just don't know. Crazy. In his fantastic book, Crazy Love, that came out in May of 2008, author and pastor Francis Chan drew up what he calls the profile of the lukewarm. And that book came out two months after our church started, and it was very, very instrumental in guiding us in our early years. And he said, uh, it's a fantastic read, it's very challenging, but in this book he lays out 16 things that uh, with his time as a pastor says characterize lukewarm, people that are infected with that's good enough itis. And he writes the following. See if, see if this describes you, okay? Because in, in, in my, in, in, I'm not calling everyone lukewarm. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that's kind of how everybody describes themselves. Is that fair? Now, I'm not really hot. I'm really not really cold. I'm really on fire. I'm not really walking away from God. I'm just kind of there. Isn't that kind of how most people describe themselves? Well, that's, that's, that's what he's talking about here. See if you find yourself in any of these 16 things. First one, lukewarm people attend church regularly. It's what good Christians do. Hey, that's a good one. I emphasize that. Second one, lukewarm people give money to charity church as long as it doesn't impinge on their standard of living. 
Lukewarm people choose what is popular, what is right, when they're in conflict. Number four, lukewarm people don't really want to be saved from their sin. They only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. Number five, lukewarm people are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ. Man, are they moved, yet they don't act. We love stories of believers over in other countries that die for their faith. But we don't do much else. Next one, lukewarm people rarely share their faith with their neighbors, coworkers, or friends. Next one, lukewarm people say they love Jesus, and, and his is indeed a part of their lives, but only a part. They give him a second of their time, money, and their thoughts, but he isn't allowed to control their lives. The next one, lukewarm people love others, but don't seek to love others as much as they love themselves. Lukewarm people will serve God and others, but there are limits to how far they will go or how much time, money, or energy they're willing to give. Lukewarm people think about life on earth much more often than eternity in heaven. Next one, lukewarm people are thankful for the luxuries and comforts and rarely consider trying to give as much as possible to the poor. Next one, lukewarm people do whatever is necessary to keep themselves from feeling too guilty. Hmm. Next one, lukewarm people are continually concerned with playing it safe. They're slave to the God of control. This is the, the one that gets me here. Lukewarm people don't live by faith. Their lives are structured so they don't have to. Next one, lukewarm people call radical what Jesus expected of all his followers. Next one, last one, lukewarm people probably drink and swear less than average, but beside that, they really aren't different from your typical unbelief. And I'm here as your pastor and as your friend warning you to guard against this. This lukewarmness, this state that, that Francis Chan described back in 2008 is calling to our souls. It is a siren call that, that promises if you will just come over here, life will be so much better. This state that I just described is going to be so much better. That's what the siren call of this culture and, and, and everything is. And so many fall for it. I'm just here to warn you against it. Because what did Jesus say that he was going to do with lukewarm people? He said he's going to spit you out of your mouth. He said, man, you look at me, the God of the universe, and you say, eh, I don't know, you kind of lukewarm towards me. He said, are you serious? He goes, I wish you were hot or cold. It's kind of like coffee, you know, like a hot cup of coffee is good or like an ice cup of coffee, but coffee's been sitting out in room temperature. You're like, whoa. That's what the Bible says. Jesus' reaction is to us when we are lukewarm. Guys, that's where we are, and that's the default. See, guys, so few people in the Bible and really in life finish strong. Our biggest spiritual victories need to be in the future, not in the past. The conquering of sin, you guys, the healing of our families, the making of disciples, the, 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 the passing on of wisdom, the, the building up of the church, the planting of new churches, the reaching of lost people, the close fellowship with God led through the Holy Spirit. Those things need to be future victories, not past ones. All right? So question is, we're all stuck here. Friction and inertia are, are keeping us where we are unless we move out of it. And I'm here to call you today. On the last day of our move series to move out of it. And the only way you move out of it is by deciding to move out of it. That's it. It's the only way. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Ask this question. What's your next step? Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, meaning the people that have gone on before us, let us throw off everything that hinders and that sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That is exactly what we need to be doing today. So what is your next step? Yes, I am challenging you to move off of the spiritual force of inertia. I'm calling you to move off of friction 
and I'm challenging you to take your next step. And it's different for every person on, in here and online. If you're not the kind of person whose all your spiritual victories are in the past and you are looking forward to some in the future, then this next section is for you. What is your next step? If you guys will take a look at your card now. Pick up your yellow card. If you don't have one on your seat, there are some more. If you need one, I've got them here. Um, if, if, they're, 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 if, if anybody needs one, I've got them, okay? I want you to, and you guys that are joining us online, I want you to look at this right now. All right. If your next step is baptism, if you have never been baptized, you have never taken that pledge, you've never committed yourself to Christ to begin the journey, then baptism is for you. Acts 2.38 challenges us this. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know what I would love? I would love in two weeks at Easter to baptize a whole bunch of people. That's what I would like. All right? So if you have never been baptized, I am challenging you that you need to take that step. And Easter Sunday is in two Sundays. We will be glad to baptize you. Invite your friends. Invite your family. Make this the biggest testimony you've ever had in your life. Let's do that. Second thing, join a community group. Those, those of you that know that here at Catalyst, we expect two time slots, one Sunday morning and one community group. People don't have much more time than that. We can give two time slots. That's what we do everything in. Acts 2, 42 through 45 is a command of scripture. It says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Guess what happens in a community group? Those things, all right? Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved because of the community that we have. All right? That's you. The next one, the big one. Big commitment. One of my favorite things. Commit to a 2022 mission trip. All right, we're going to five places. Jamaica, Haiti, Honduras, Kenya, and India. Um, and if you can't go, two years ago, we challenged people to either be senders or goers. A goer, somebody who goes, sender, someone who can't go, but will actually support people. Now, if you are a sender, if you were a sender two years ago, you all know that our, our 2020 kind of wrecked our mission trip stuff, okay? That we have that all of that money. It's more it's like $14,000 that you all gave. It's amazing. We have it in an account and we are planning on putting it towards our 2022 mission trips. Thank you so much for doing it. We have not touched that. It is for mission trips and so we we have that for people that go. So if you would like to be a sender, sign up to do that. There's a fund on online to do that. Um the Jamaica trip, John Kelly and Rob Harlem are, are going to be leading that one. Okay? Um, that, that's that's uh, to, to our mission there. Um, in Haiti, Marty and Kim Allen. Uh, Honduras, Kevin Mink. Kevin, raise your hand. Right there. He's leading that trip. Um, the Kenya trip. We're looking for a leader right now. Uh, India. I'm, I'm going to be leading that one. The India trip is going to be um, the most difficult mission trip I've ever led. And this is why. I asked our, our, our contact over there, Ravi. I asked him. I said, where are the hardest, the most unreached, most desperate places? He goes, uh, we got plenty of them. I said, that's where we're going. It's going to be the least of these mission trips. We're going to go serve in leper colonies and go serve in a, 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 a basically a village for people that are blind, um, beggars, uh, people that, 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 are, that, that if the Lord doesn't provide for them today, they don't eat. We're going to go serve and we're going to go fellowship. We're going to go present the gospel to the least uh, and most neglected people you've ever seen. And, and that, that's, where we're, that's what the India trip is going to be. Um, and if you, if you indicate on your card to do that, we will get in contact with you. Uh, but it takes about a year for these to plan out. These are all going out in 2022, right? Um, next one, uh, serve in the church. Uh, some of us that are standing on the promises are actually just sitting on the premises. And we need to actually start serving in the church. Um, uh, we, we have a need for a workers and children's ministry, influencing the next generation. We need youth ministry. We're losing a lot of our, uh, no, we're not losing. We're sending a lot of our youth volunteers out to our church plant and, and elevate. Uh, we're going to need a lot of people to start working with our youth. Uh, we need people in the tech ministry. Uh, we need people in the hospitality coffee ministry. Guess what? Coffee starts back on Easter Sunday. Yeah, yeah. 
That's right. Uh, for those of you that are online, especially my parents, uh, there was a big cheer that just went up because they love coffee. Uh, we need people in worship ministry. We need people in the men's and women's ministry. I want you to guys start serving there. Uh, the next one, tithe and giving. Some of you all are living in direct disobedience to, to, to God's command. Um, and and uh, it's time to, start, time to start doing that. Jesus said it yourself, it is he himself, that what, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We always put money towards things that we think are important. All right? Plain and simple. If you don't put money towards it, you're not serious about it. That's just the way it is, y'all. All right? Um, next one, foster, adopt. Some of you are, are feeling the call of God to open your home to orphans, uh, people that, that, that are, are, are uh, children that need you. Foster or adopt. A lot of the children over in the children's ministry are foster or adopted children. I love it. I love it. I love seeing the gospel there in action. Um, next one, this is a passion of mine, full-time ministry. If you, we need church planters. We need pastors. We need children's ministers. We need youth ministers. We need worship ministers coming out of this church, going out and building the body of Christ. And if you are feeling a call to full-time ministry, I want to talk to you. I want to mentor you. I want to disciple you. And I want to send you out to be a force for the kingdom, if that is your calling. Um, guys, we all saw the profile of the lukewarm. We saw that, and a lot of us found ourselves in that, right? Now, there's a different profile I want to share with you. There's a different profile I want to share with you. This is the one that I try to live by, and I say try. But it's called Fellowship the Unashamed. I'm going to invite the band to come on back up. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't let, look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. And my future is secure. I am finished and done. With low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, chintzy giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by presence, le learn by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. I will not hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I have preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go till he returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My clothes will be clear, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. That's the profile that we want here, not the lukewarm. What I want you guys to do this morning is look at this awesome, huge, incredible God that we serve and repent that we have just kind of said, uh, you know, maybe. What I would rather you do is walk away from Christ, just say, I don't want any part of you, or run towards him and embrace him rather than this patronizing, you know, I'll give you a little bit of myself. So what's it gonna be, church? What's your next step? What we're going to do, we're going to have some time, some music time where you can think, where you can pray, where you can repent. And then when it comes time for communion and offering, I want to ask you if you're ready to fill out a card. I want to ask you to put it in the offering plate or, or next to the offering plate when you come. If you need a week or two or whatever to think, you're not ready to make any commitments, then take it home and bring it back next week. Or communicate to us online. Whatever it is, let us know what your next step is. Every person in here has a next step. 
Don't say, well, nah, I'm good. No. No, you're not. No, you're not good. Our next, our next step is in front of us. So make sure that you let us know. Let us help you achieve that. We're your church. We're your church family. My next step is I'm taking two mission trips next year, one to Honduras and, one to, and leading the one to India. I've never held the hand of a leper before. I've never done it. But you know who did? Jesus. And if we are going to be followers of his, we do what Jesus did. And so that is what the Holy Spirit has led me to do. That's my next step as your pastor. I have a next step, and so do you. So I want to invite you to pray with me, and then we will do, and then we will go to the Lord and worship, and then we'll continue in our service. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your call. Lord, having lived as a person, you know the siren call of lukewarmness, and that's good enough, Itis. You know that our, the biggest desire of our hearts isn't for you, but it's just for complacency and mediocrity. And Lord, hear me as pastor of this church, as I lead this church in repentance of minimizing you, of choosing mediocrity over you, of choosing complacency over you, of looking up at you and your awesome majesty and just saying, eh, eh, I got it, it's good. Lord, I pray that you would rid us of that. Lord, I pray that you would send us out to bear fruit for your kingdom. Lord, for the lost people in here who don't know you, I pray that they would be saved this morning. For the people, the, the, the complacent saints in here, I pray that they would move forward and have spiritual victories in the future. More than that, Lord, I pray that you would, that, that you would cause us to love each other, to love each other into action, to establish a culture we cheer on people who are making commitments and decisions for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus we pray.